Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bijan Kimirgar, Associate Executive Director for Research at Citizens Committee for Children at New of New York. Uh, for those of you joining one of CCC's webinars for the first time, welcome. Citizens Committee for Children is an independent and nonpartisan child advocacy organization. We combine public policy research and data analysis with citizen action to engage policymakers, service providers, and the public at large to promote practical solutions that ensure every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. In today's webinar, we will share a new data resource that examines barriers to child and family well being in each of New York City's 59 community districts. The analysis examines data across six different domains of well being collected prior to the COVID 19 pandemic as well as data collected in the past year on the impacts of the pandemic on households with children in the New York metropolitan area. When these data from before and during the pandemic are viewed together, they expose how the unprecedented public health crisis coincided with and exacerbated existing crises of economic inequality and racial injustice. New York City is at a pivotal moment. We can either choose to maintain the status quo and uphold long-standing inequalities, or we can choose to break down barriers to, to well-being and advance equity and recovery for all New York City's children and families. Today, I'm joined by four of my colleagues at Citizens Committee for Children, who will share both findings from our report and policy priorities that inform a path to a more equitable future for New York City. I want to remind all of you that while you may be muted during the presentation portion of the webinar, you are essential to our conversation please put your thoughts, comments, and your questions in the chat or the Q&A form throughout the presentation, and we will address them during the discussion today or follow up via email. I also encourage you to join our eAction network to receive updates when we release new research and policy advocacy resources and engage with us on social media. We are at, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at CCC New York. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will speak during the webinar today and who are also collaborators on the report. In addition to myself uh, speaking, Sophia Halkidis, data analyst on the CCC team, will present findings. Raisa Rodriguez, Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy. Alice Bufkin, Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health. And Daryl Hornick Becker, Policy and Advocacy Associate, will also be sharing uh, our work. Next slide, please. Uh, today, I will be sharing information about the goals of the report, the data resources we use, and the information it provides. Sophia will present the summary of findings both from the Wellbeing Index as well as from our analysis of complementary data from the Household Pulse Survey. And Raisa, as well as De uh, Alice and Daryl, will share CCC's policy priorities to advance child and family well-being in New York City. And there's a link here available to the report. Uh, it's also, uh, we'll put it in the chat. Next slide, please. So the goals of our report and the background. Since 2016, uh, CCC has released an annual index which ranks New York City's 59 community districts on 18 indicators of child and family well-being. A goal of this analysis is to show in which community districts families are more likely to face multiple barriers to their well-being and to spur action by government, philanthropic organizations, direct service providers, advocates, and New Yorkers at large to improve child and family well-being in specific communities and citywide. Next slide, please. Data in this report come from multiple sources. To create our multi-dimensional index of well-being, we use data from the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey, as well as data from multiple New York City agencies. All of these data are from prior to the pandemic. The most recent data we have available on the impacts of the pandemic on families in the New York City area come from the Household Pulse Survey a new product from the U.S. Census Bureau designed specifically to understand and inform countermeasures to address the impacts of the pandemic. I will go over how we use this information in more details in the next slides. Next slide, please. Child and family well-being is complex and multidimensional. So to create a holistic understanding of well-being in New York City, CCC developed an index that uses 18 indicators to create a composite index score. There are three indicators in each of the six domains of well-being, economic security, housing, health, education, youth, 
and lastly, family and community. We developed this index through a process of reviewing similar analyses of child and family well-being in the United States, as well as internationally. Sophia will cover the data in this index in more details in the next sections. Next slide, please. We rank community districts based on their composite index scores for the 18 indicators, as well as for each domain. We categorize the index score overall and for each domain into five, uh, into five categories, corresponding with the level of risk. Highest risk, risk, which in the legend is the red color, uh, moderate high risk, which is the orange color, moderate risk, which is yellow, moderate low, which is the lighter blue, and lowest risk, which is the darker blue. The community district with the greatest overlapping barriers is ranked number one or first and is placed in the highest risk category, the darkest red or orange. And the community districts ranked 59th is placed in the lowest risk category, so the darker blue. It's important to note that the 59 community district boundaries are similar to the boundaries of New York City's community boards. More details about the data and our methodology are available in the appendix of our report. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit about the household pulse survey data. So in addition to the annual index that we produce, we analyze data from the household pulse survey, which is a snapshot survey. It's an experimental product and separate from the decennial census and the American community survey, both which also took place during 2020. Data collection for the household pulse survey commenced in April, 2020. It was originally designed as a 12 week survey to measure household experiences during the coronavirus pandemic. But here we are today, one year later, and it continues to remain active and the questionnaire continues to evolve over multiple phases. The Census Bureau disseminates results in near real time for states, as well as the 15 largest metropolitan statistical areas across the country. CCC has continually analyzed pulse survey data for the New York metropolitan area. While the data are from the survey are not exclusively for New York City, they offer an essential source of information on how families in the area are impacted. What we will detail in the presentation today are the results from phases one and two of the Pulse survey, which ran from about April to the end of October. If you'd like to learn more about our analysis of data from this survey, I encourage you also to view the webinar that we released last year in November where research associate Jack Mullen goes over this work in detail. Next slide, please. This year's edition of our annual report is chock full of information. So I'd just like to take a moment to walk through how we've organized sections of the work. We include the results of our overall index, including maps and tables on the left side of the page. And on the right side, we summarize results of the index as well as information on the impacts of the pandemic. It's on this right-hand section where we also provide charts looking at data from the Household Pulse Survey. Next slide, please. In addition to our written report that is available online, you can also find the results of our annual index in an interactive map on our uh, database data.cccnewyork.org forward slash risk ranking. And while you are there, I encourage you to explore all the digital tools available in the database. We host hundreds of indicators about New York City, as well as maps of community assets that are essential components of CCC's strength-based approach to community-based assessments. Next slide, please. At this point, it's my pleasure to pass the baton to Sophia, who will share more about, share more about the report findings. Sophia. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, glad to be here with you, and, and thank you for tuning in to hear about the results of our Child and Family Wellbeing Index this year. So I'm going to jump right in, starting with the overall index results. And so um, the overall index results really represents the concentration of risks across multiple domains that Bajan mentioned. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we see a map in the gradient that Bajan uh, shared in terms of the way that we organize our map. Um, and on the right hand side, we have a table with a bunch of numbers that show where the highest and the lowest community district rank across the other domains of well being. And what you can see is that we have consistently high numbers, right, in this lowest ranking community. Um, and we have consistently low numbers in this highest ranking community, 
which really shows the concentration of risks uh, across multiple domains. And these areas are shaded, the, the highest risk areas are shaded in the darkest orange on the map, which we can see. And what's really, what we found this year in this analysis is that the seven community districts, which rank in the highest risk category overall, have ranked in the highest risk category every year since we've done this publication in 2016, demonstrating that even when progress occurs within districts and citywide, we see disparities between communities persist. And this includes the Bronx communities of Mott Haven, Morrisania, Hunts Point, East Tremont, University Heights, and Concourse Highbridge, as well as Brownsville in Brooklyn. And children in, and families in these communities are more likely to face significant barriers across several domains of well-being in this index, including economic security, housing, health, um, youth, and education. But it's really important to notice to, to note when we view these ranking data that the intent of this analysis is not best and worst, but really is about barriers to well being and barriers to thriving for children and families. These risk factors and barriers are related to a history of disinvestment across systems, segregation in some of our cornerstone institutions, discriminatory service delivery, and race based criteria for wealth building and asset accumulation. And so we see. Um, Despite a really ethnically and racially diverse child population in New York City, children who are Black or Hispanic are the majority of racial and ethnic groups in New York City community districts where there are greater barriers to well being, shown by the chart on the left here, the child population in communities that are in the highest risk category in our index. Conversely, the child population in community districts where barriers to well being are lowest are majority, majority white. And this pattern is evidence of the persistent and systemic racism and discrimination, but not inherent differences between racial and ethnic groups. And with the overall data, we also looked at the incidence of hospitalization and COVID data um, across New York City's five boroughs. Data on COVID-19 cases, on hospitalizations and deaths for zip codes also illustrate differences between community districts that we found ranked in the highest risk category compared to those in the lowest risk category. Most communities ranked in the highest risk category were located in the Bronx, which has the highest rate of COVID-19 related deaths, as you can see on the top right map. Conversely, most districts which ranked in the lowest risk category were located in Manhattan, which has the lowest cumulative COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths of any borough, and also contains many of the zip codes with the highest vaccination rates in the city. And the presence of multiple barriers that we talk about in this report um, and more uh, to well-being in communities of color, including higher rates of child poverty, of overcrowded housing, and in lack of access to health care, have been contributors and products of the disproportionate devastation of COVID-19 in communities of color, which has detrimentally impacted the well-being of children and has trickle-down impacts, such as disruption in routine health care visits and skyrocketing behavioral health needs. So with this overall picture, I'm going to go into the domain results, starting with economic security. In the economic security domain, we look at the indicators listed on the right, child poverty rate, the median income for families with children, and parental employment instability, which is the share of children living in households where neither the householder nor a spouse worked full time in the past year. And when we look at these data, just in the two community districts ranked in the highest and lowest risk, we really see a vast difference um, at both ends of the spectrum. And you can compare these charts, and I'm going to just take apart some some overall key findings that we found um, across districts. And so in, seven in the seven community districts in the lowest risk category, we found that median incomes were at least four times higher than the 12 districts in the highest risk category. And something worth noting about this median income data, we can see here juxtaposed in University Heights, a $24,000 know, median income for families with children compared to a $250,000 median income in Greenwich Village. But this $250,000 income is actually a top coded value from the Census Bureau. So this is to say that the median income in Greenwich Village and other communities may very well be higher than $250,000 and may not even, so we may not even be capturing um, fully the gap that exists in the city. But with that being said, this is still very shocking. Um, we also look to child poverty and we saw that more than a third of children were in poverty in all of the districts in the highest risk category, 
as well as one in two children in University Heights, as we see here. Um, but in the lowest risk category, child poverty estimates were below 8%, so single digits. Uh, of course, we want no children to be living in poverty. But we also found that less than a quarter of children lived in households where neither the householder nor a spouse worked full-time in the past year in districts, districts ranked in the lowest risk category compared to more than 44% in districts in the highest risk category. So this all just really represents significant differences in capital for families within the same city. And these troubling economic trends were precursors to the record job and wage loss, loss of benefits, and con severely constrained work opportunities that were brought on by the pandemic. Data from the Household Pulse Survey uh, reveal that households with children were more likely to be disrupted by loss of employment income since the start of the pandemic. So here we see that 60% of households with children reported loss of employment income since March. Um, and we see that more than two thirds, two thirds of black or Latino headed households um, and more than three quarters of lower income households experienced employment income loss during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we know, you know, lack of financial stability has a huge impact on other, other areas of life, which we will get into. So on to the housing domain. In this domain, we look at severe rent burden, which is the percentage of renters who pay more than half of their income on rent. We looked at rental overcrowding, and we looked at families with children in shelters. And what we found is that communities in the Bronx had the highest rates of families experiencing homelessness of any borough, with 10 or more families with children in shelter per thousand household in Morsania, Concourse, Highbridge, in Mott Haven, University Heights, East Tremont, and Hunts Point. We found that in nearly every community district, actually 53 out of 59, more than 20% of renters pay more than half of their income on rent. Um, and in communities ranked in the highest risk category in the housing domain, this share is more than 30%. And we also found that the share of rental overcrowded households ranged quite a bit from less than 4% in some communities to more than 25% in others, such as Sunset Park, Borough Park, Elmhurst Corona, and Jackson Heights. And paired with record loss of, in, of employment and income loss across the, the city during the pandemic, we see you know, the pre-existing unaffordability of rent has really set up a housing crisis. Um, and we see that data from the Household Pulse shows that the pandemic has really compounded the patterns of racial inequalities in housing and secu housing security. We see in this chart, um, the share of tenants living with children who reported either slight or no confidence in their ability to meet next month's rent. And we see that black and Latino renters with children report significantly higher degrees of housing security compared to right, white renters with children. Um, and of course, in current context, we know that the state and federal eviction moratorium do offer a varying degree of protection for families, but the risk of eviction is really only likely to rise absent concerted efforts to address housing security that's at the root of this, uh, you know, it was, as at the root and was available, was existing in the data before the pandemic. And next we go to the health domain. In the health domain, we look at infant mortality rate, the share of babies who are born at low birth weight, and the share of children without health insurance. And the differences in this domain are most pronounced in infant health outcomes, as the city has nearly universal health care coverage for children. We see that the infant mortality rate and the share of babies born at low birth weight is two to three times higher in the districts ranked as highest, high, highest risk compared to districts ranked at lower risk. And this is just a map that I always find fascinating. Uh, we can see that there's this really long strip here of districts that are ranked in the highest or moderate high risk. Again, very much so driven by these birth outcomes. And we see, you know, Bayside, Queens Village, Jamaica St. Albans, the Rockaways, and then all into Brooklyn, you know, with East Flatbush, East New York, Brownsville, um, Canarsie. And so this is just a very different map than some of the others. And I always call attention to it. Um, we also looked at uninsured children and 11 districts across risk categories have rates of uninsured children double or triple the citywide estimate of 2%. Um, but some of the highest estimates are in some Queens neighborhoods, such as Bayside, Flushing, the Rockaways, and Elmhurst Corona. Um, and in traditionally high income neighborhoods, such as Bayside or Murray Hill Stuyvesant. However, it's worth noting with the health insurance data 
that the estimates do have large margins of error and should be interpreted with caution, perhaps driven by differing demographics between CDs, which is a contributor to both the margins of error and the estimates themselves. But of course, we continue to monitor these data um, year after year, and it's important to see if they are um, stable over time. With the household pulse data, and though children largely benefit from health insurance coverage in the city, data from the household pulse show that adults lacking health insurance are more likely to be Hispanic, Latino, um, have lower incomes, or to be out of work. And research has shown that efforts to increase coverage, insurance coverage for adults, leads to a greater proportion of eligible children enrolling in coverage, and also the health care of family members impacts the health and well-being of children. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we saw that lack of, lack of health insurance contributed to high rates of infection and disproportionate spread among immigrant and low-income communities, um, really driving home the importance of health, in, health insurance coverage in the state and city. In the education domain, we look at different time points across the education, the education continuum. We look at early education enrollment, ELA and math test scores, and high school graduation rates. And what we find is that the four districts in the highest risk category were categorized by low rates of proficiency on ELA and math exams paired with low graduation rates. The districts with the lowest early education enrollment we're actually ranked in the moderate and moderate high risk categories and include Queens and Bronx districts such as Flushing, Woodhaven, Elmhurst Corona, Howard Beach, Bedford Park, and Concourse Highbridge compared to more than 78% in the lowest risk districts. The share of students who scored proficiently on math and ELA score exams varies considerably across the city with less than a third of students passing in almost all of the highest risk districts compared to more than two thirds in the lowest risk districts. Um, in fact, almost all of the communities in the highest and moderate high risk categories have pass rates below 50%. But with this you know, emphasis on pass rates and you know, these data, it's worth noting that math and ELA scores were of course imperfect measures of student performance before the pandemic, but since the pandemic, the landscape of standardizing, standardized tests has since changed. The state proficiency exams were waived in 2020. And while they will be administered this year, many families may choose to opt out and not take them amidst the disruption that COVID-19 has played on, the education, on their education, um, which might just make the measurement and assessment of education outcomes during this school year more difficult to reliably track over time. Um, so it's just worth noting with these data. And of course, these data represent in-person pre-pandemic outcomes, but we've seen that additional disparities have emerged from the current environment of remote learning or hybrid learning. Beyond student effort, success in remote learning environment is contingent on reliable internet access, device access, and is further affected by the bandwidth of caregivers, technical competency of caregivers, and by physical space. So according to the DOE, uh, we saw only 85% of students had interactions with remote learning during the spring 2020 term. And further, data from the Household Pulse demonstrate gaps in live instruction and live contact with students by demographic lines, driven by inequitable access to education supports. We see that between September and November, heads of households who are Black were more than three times as likely to report their child had zero days of live contact with the teacher, and this discrepancy is a result of both remote access issues and children returning to school at disproportionate rates and really demonstrates the tragic compounded impact of educational resources and the digital divide. Pivoting to the youth domain, we looked at the teen birth rates, teen idleness, which is 16 to 19 year olds out of school and out of work and youth unemployment for 20 to 24 year olds. And all five community districts in the highest risk category were in this domain located in the Bronx, shown by the darkest orange or red area on the map, which includes Mott Haven, Hunts Point, East Tremont, Morrisania, and University Heights. And these districts had teen birth rates above 20 per, 20 per thousand girls, more than 10% um, of teens out of school are not working, and youth employment rates below or above 18% compared to districts in the lowest risk, which had teen birth rates below five, um, less than 5% of teens out of school and out of work, and less than 11% of youth unemployed. What's really interesting about this and not shown immediately from the data 
is that um, districts in the highest risk category actually had more youth and youth made up a larger share of the total district's residents than in the communities and the lowest risk category. And this just really highlights the importance of appropriate distribution of resources, which are assets to youth. And my policy colleagues will speak a little bit more about what some of those are. In the Pulse survey, we see, and, and we know historically, young people have been pushed out of the job market during times of economic decline in the city. Following the recession, rates of unemployment for teens 16 to 19 increased, but was met with um, increased investment and participation in the summer youth employment program. More, more recently, of course, youth have been disproportionately employed in jobs that are at greater risk of displacement from the pandemic, which is shown in the chart of the left, nearly one in two young people, uh, I mean, um, rather, which is available for people 18 to 24. On the right side, we see that loss of income, amongst, among many other things, can contribute to stress young people are facing during the pandemic. And since the start of the pandemic, Youth 18 to 24 have reported symptoms of anxiety and depression at alarming rates with nearly one in two young people. And of course, just taking this in context, you know, we need to think of that, we make sure that youth have the tools needed to transition into a successful adulthood. In the last domain, we look at family and community and we look at single parent families, adults without a high school degree and the violent felony rate. And while these characteristics aren't inherently risky, families might face more significant barriers to financial stability and mobility, um, which is why we look at these data. And here we see that the map is more blue as there's more districts in the two lower risk categories. And more than what we found is that more than 55% of households were single parent households in communities that ranked in the highest risk category compared to less than 15% in the lowest risk category. In the community districts that ranked as highest risk, approximately a third of residents did not have a high school degree. And taken together, again, these indicators point to community level risks for financial stability and mobility. Uh, when we look, districts in the, in the lowest risk category tended to have a lower violent crime rate below 2.5 per thousand residents compared to 6.5 in the highest risk districts. And it's worth noting that these crime rates are not a perfect measure. In fact, in this index, we use violent felony rates as a proxy for exposure to violence, as well as a component of community safety that might limit access to supports which people rely on to function, like transportation, um, childcare, parks, playgrounds, food retail, banks, and programming. And in this, last section of family and community, we see that the tempor temporary closures in child care, uh, temporary closures of child care rather, and remote schooling did require many caregivers to stop working and stay at home to care for children. And single-headed households might face more constraints on time and income, which make them most in need of child care, but least likely to afford it. So based on data from the Household Pulse, we see that 9% of men and 24% of women in the New York City metro area cited caring for children as their primary reason for not working during the pandemic. These constraints on income diminish families' abilities to meet other basic needs and ultimately really impacts their health. The data also reveal that 40% of households with children reported that it was sometimes or often the case that their children's, children were not eating enough because they couldn't afford food. So the data in this domain, the data throughout this report really make clear the need for an equitable access to resources and infrastructure that help children and families thrive. I'm gonna just pause here. This sums up the key findings of this presentation, but I will pass it to the policy team to discuss the roadmap to recovery. Thanks, Sophia. Um, next, we're gonna be hearing from Risa, Alice, and Daryl on CCC's policy priorities. As I mentioned, New York City is at a pivotal moment right now where we can choose to maintain the status quo or break down those inequalities that we have seen in the data and in our lived experience. And Raisa and her team will be going over what strategies we should have for a more equitable future. Thank you, Bijan. Hello, everyone. I'm Raisa Rodriguez. I head of policy and advocacy at CCC. Um, we are Grateful that you're here with us uh, this afternoon to hear about this important data. Um, Bijan described it perfectly. Our goal is to really leverage this moment, use this data as an important tool to support our advocacy, but also to call attention to 
um, the needs of children and families, particularly and especially as we turn to recovery. Um, I'll start off with the economic security domain and policy implications on that side. Um, you heard the data, you know, we are incredibly concerned about the well-being of children, um, particularly as a result of the pandemic, but also in terms of the impact of the economic uh, sh shutdown. We know that um, recovery needs to be equitable um, because the impact of the economic shutdown was by far um, not equal. We heard that uh, families with children are much more likely to experience and uh, face income loss. Um, and we wanna make sure that our policies really are aimed to combating some of that risk. Um, in the area of child poverty specifically, we think that there is an important opportunity to supplement and build on you know, this historic uh, investment on the federal side from the American Rescue Plan and other opportunities to really look at ways to deepen what we know are effective tax tools like deepening the New York City Earned Income Tax Credit and reforming the city's child and dependent care credit to ensure that we cover more families with children and those who are not uh, covered during, with co uh, current benefits. Also exploring opportunities to invest early on, to connect all kindergartners with a college saving platform. We've seen promising results there. Um, we think it's an opportunity to really look at ways um, to provide incentives to do much more of this across the city. Um, at, at the community level, ensuring that all communities benefit from banks and credit unions, um, and looking to ensure that no workers are excluded from family leave and sick leave as well. Um, in terms of making work pay and ensuring we remove disincentives, um, looking at ways to either strengthen entitlements and hunger, anti-hunger initiatives through expansion of eligibility, um, looking for ways to removing barriers, um, and really paying attention to trade-offs and how, in many instances, uh, benefit cliffs, cliffs serve at, as critical barriers to um, accessing entitlement programs. Um, and then lastly, looking at ways to advance more parity among contracted workers to ensure that both from a compensation and a benefit standpoint, they are on par with city workforce peers. We know that this workforce is often much more low income um, and in many instances, um, disproportionately black and brown. Um, in the area of housing domain, next slide, thank you. Um, a lot of intersection here. We've, you know, have known that we are um, dealing with a, a housing crisis even before the pandemic. Um, this is an area that's incredibly tied to economic insecurity. We know more households are facing economic insecurity that has a, a, a direct relationship with housing security. Um, right now, as you heard, there is an eviction moratorium in place um, that in many ways serves as a barrier, as a, as a Band-Aid, um, but we need to really pay attention from a policy standpoint how to address uh, the crisis that will unlikely will, will likely result in a higher number of children and families entering shelter. So we've been pursuing things like homelessness prevention at a community level early on before a crisis ensues, um, and also supporting families who exit shelter with the appropriate support services that are necessary, whether it's subsidies, which we know are an effective tool at preventing homelessness, um, but also increasing subsidies amount so that they are actually competitive in the market um, and fully cover the full cost of rent in places like New York City. Um, we've also been con and continue to pursue and, and advance policies that address um, expanding affordable housing options and expanding supportive housing at a community level, specifically for families with children. Um, and in addition, uh, to address inequity, looking at ways to ensure that the affordable housing stock is safe and that our public housing infrastructure um, is of high quality and, and addresses repair needs adequately. With that, I'll turn it to my colleague, Alice, who will walk through health implications. Thank you, Raisa. Um, as Raisa said, I'm going to touch briefly on some of the health-related policy considerations that follow from this uh, well-being index. Um, first, we know that infant health remains such a critical indicator for the health of whole populations. And New York City has done a lot of work in recent years to invest in initiatives that improve infant and maternal health outcomes, ranging from improving the quality of maternity care in hospitals to home visiting programs to maternal and child health services at the Department of Health. 
And we've seen a welcome decline in poor infant health outcomes in recent years. But as you saw from the data that uh, Sophia presented, we still have pockets of the city where the infant mortality rate is more than double or triple the rates in other parts of the city. And we still see deep racial disparities in infant maternal health outcomes. Um, when it comes to addressing these issues, as a city, we need to continue investing in initiatives and programs that work across the continuum of a parent's life, including reproductive health care, prenatal care, and postpartum services. We also need to be providing continuous coverage and high quality programming for both babies and their parents in those critical first few years of life. This includes investing in community organizations that directly serve families. It also includes building on approaches and initiatives that confront systemic racism and practices that contribute to these disparities. Um, I'm next going to touch on one of the places where we see many of the indicators in this index intersect, and that's particularly in light of COVID-19, and that's in the area of behavioral health. Um, as you all know, and as this presentation has underscored, we've seen unprecedented loss of loved ones, economic distress, housing insecurity, hunger, isolation, anxiety over the past year. And as these needs have grown, but access to behavioral health services has been limited and has gotten significantly worse for, for young people and their families, we've seen a deeply concerning spike in children showing up in emergency rooms and hospitals at younger ages with higher levels of need. All of this points to the need to address housing and economic insecurity and child welfare issues, all of those intersecting needs that are highlighted in this report, but it also points to how desperately under-resourced our system is for children's behavioral health. We need to invest in a full continuum of services in the places where children are. So that includes in homes, in pediatric settings, in communities, in schools. And that means providing universal and wraparound services for children who have any level of need, as well as ensuring that children with a greater level of need have access to clinical care. We won't be able to confront the long-term impacts of this pandemic without a really robust and comprehensive investment in children's behavioral health system at both the city and the state level. And finally, with COVID, we've seen a deeply concerning decline in access to preventive and primary health services. Um, a report that came out during the peak of the pandemic showed a national 22% decline in vaccinations, a 44% decline in child screenings and mental health services, and a 69% decline in dental services for children in Medicaid and CHIP. So we know we really can't afford to move forward without a coordinated and proactive approach to identify and provide services to children who missed out on critical care because of the pandemic. So this includes approaches like outreach and education on available services, enhanced investments in health navigators and community-based organizations, investments in mobile screening and treatment services, and supports to child-serving agencies so they can improve screening and referrals to care. Um, this should be a collaborative cross-agency work to account for the way that children's access to care has been disrupted across systems. Systems, not just in one area. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Daryl, who's going to talk about some of the education um, implications. Thanks, Alice. So hi, everyone. I'm Daryl, and I handle the education area. And I think what we saw in the education domain in terms of the index is that a lot of the driving of the higher risk ranking was from low early education enrollment. And so while New York City is really a leader in early childhood education, we know we have universal pre-K for four-year-olds. And we also know recently it was announced that our universal pre-K for three-year-olds or 3K, which is available in some districts, is set to be funded and expanded to be universal by 2023. There's still several gaps in, in early care and education service that needs to be addressed to improve enrollment and really, really drive up that indicator. Um, one of those biggest gaps is children younger than three. So we have we have UPK for fours and we have three and we have three K, but there's a real lack of affordable care options for infants and toddlers. And CCC actually did a, a really informative study on this that was released in December on just how much of a cost burden infant and toddler care can be in New York City. Um, so in terms of our policy and advocacy in the area, uh, CCC in partnership with with members and our partners in the Campaign for Children. We're really trying to work for the city to use newly available federal funds and city to tax levy to expand access to support family child care providers who currently supply the bulk of care. But more broadly and long term in this area, we're working to influence the next mayoral, um, the next mayor and the next mayoral administration that this is where investments need to be made, that this is the next frontier of early education, and this is where we can really support families, childcare, and getting people back to work. And that all can be also said with extended day and year-round care. What we know from our system of 3K and UPK in New York City is that offering care just during school hours isn't an option for most working families and actually can be a real barrier to care. 
So working to ensure that there's no loss of current extended day and summer options this year with new contracts with this budget. And then again, more long term, ensuring that the next administration knows any future contracts or services, any system they want to build up in terms of early care, it has to be full day and it has to be year round. The other parts of an educational recovery um, involve year round youth de uh, development opportunities for young people. The good news, sorry, uh, previous slide. Um, the good news is that even though we've long fought for more funding and access to after school and summer programs, the, the city has finally kind of realized the value of those type of programs and is launching a large scale summer program for students. This year, grades K through eight called Summer Rising, which may be, many of you may be familiar with. We're excited about that proposal as CCC, um, but we really wanna make sure that the CBO is running that program, have the resources they need to make it work as well as increased rates per student and adequate time to plan. Maybe most importantly about Summer Rising is that it's one-time funded. And as we know, this is the last year of this mayoral administration. So again, long-term, we're focused on informing the campaigns and the next administration that the summer programs like Summer Rising, robust summer programming are extremely beneficial and valuable, but they have to be multi-year multi planning efforts and baseline so we can keep them up and running and keep them robust. And last thing, the education space, CCC has historically done a lot of advocacy on the needs of the most vulnerable students in our systems. That's students with disabilities, that's students living in temporary housing, that's English language learners. And as part of an educational recovery effort from, from moving past COVID, we can't lose that focus. And so with partners, again, we're advocating for specific efforts within the DOE's recovery plan to target those students. Now, the good news is that there's $500 million in the budget this year just for some type of academic recovery. We want to ensure that anything additional, any supports are offered to those students. It means that students in temporary housing or living in shelters have transportation options if there's enrichment and tutoring offered after school or that English language learners taking um, English as new language classes have kind of tutoring offered to them as well. For students with disabilities, the DOE announced over $230 million in the next year's budget to strengthen special ed services. And we're, we're excited and eager to see kind of what exactly that means. But they also announced new money for preschoolers with disabilities, which is a really important issue area for us because currently there's a shortage of seats for, for young New Yorkers who have developmental delays, delays and disabilities. And so we'll be working with our partners to ensure that preschool special educators get so, some form of salary parity with that new investment. Um, parity that is with their counterparts in schools because we can't expand that program and add seats without also compensating those teachers. On the youth domain, now you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Sophia. On the youth domain, uh, driving risk factors in that domain in, in the index we saw were teen unemployment and the percentages of out of work and out of school youth. In both of those areas, historically, SYUP, the Summer Youth Employment Program, has been one of the best and most effective policies that, co that combats both of those indicators. Um, we were very happy to see SYUP restored in this year's budget after it was decimated in last year's budget. Um, it's funded this year to serve approximately 75,000 teens, um, which is great. And it's about the same level as SYUP served uh, pre-pandemic to like summer 2019. But it's important to note that in summer 2019, over 150,000 um, young people applied for those 75,000 spots. So while 75,000 is a restoration and it's great, we need to expand more. And so along with our partners and, and our members in Campaign for Children, we're advocating for further expansion. Um, it could be tricky this year to expand a lot because there's still jobs coming back on the market. We want to make sure there's enough placements. But again, focusing on the next mayor and the next mayor administration, SYP needs to become universal um, sooner rather than later. And in terms of year round work opportunities, uh, we support the expansion of community schools that was announced in this budget. Um, we want to make sure that that expansion is fully funded in terms of those new community schools coming online and also the restoration and expansion and investment of work opportunities and career education through programs like Learning to Work and Work, Learn, Grow. And lastly, in terms of restorative justice, um, the executive budget did include a funding and expansion of restorative justice practices um, and training for teachers in restorative justice practices with funding attached to it, which is really good. But we still join other advocates and partners in trying to highlight the discrepancy of the budget for school safety officers and in, in prioritizing the reduction or reappropriation of the $450 million budget um, for that sector. So we're still advocating for removing police presence in schools and reinvesting those funds in mental health supports and staff and in healing centered models models of schools. And with that, I think we'll turn it over back to Risa.
for the last domain. Thank you, Darrow. Um, in the last uh, domain, family and community, um, here we're calling attention to um, broader policies and investments that we can make sure we can make to make, ensure that all communities have equitable access to the infrastructure that we know are necessary and is necessary for um, child well-being. So things like protecting and expanding child welfare prevention and the entire continuum of prevention from primary to general is something that's to general prevention to evidence-based practice is something that we've been calling attention to. We know that these supports at the community level have been incredibly important, um, particularly during COVID. Um, and so we wanna continue to ensure that those services and supports are ready, readily available across communities. Um, also calling for um, all communities to have um, what we know children need and families need to thrive. So things like access to um, parks, safe parks, access to affordable, nutritious food, um, retail um, and maintained um, green spaces, as well as accessible, affordable transportation options, um, as well as um, adequate street lights, sidewalks, all the things that, you know, in many ways we take advantage, but we know are necessary for children and families to A, be safe and um, B, promote community safety and well-being. Um, and then lastly, um, no other example right now is more timely than ad ad adequate and equitable access to broadband, ensuring that broadband is access accessible through uh, improved wiring. This is something that we've been calling attention to um, and continue to do so to ensure all communities have access to um, internet and Wi-Fi. With that, I'll check with my colleagues on any unanswered questions. Thank you, Raisa, Alice, Daryl, for all of these details. Um, we do have a question uh, in the Q&A form, and I'll, I'll ask that. And before I ask that, I'll just say to all attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or even the Q&A form, and uh, we'll get to them either today or since we're running close to the top of the hour, uh, we'll definitely follow up over email if you registered. Uh, you probably have your email, your email on file with us, so we'll get back to you. Um, but one of the questions was specific around uh, state legislation, uh, where uh, the attendee was asking, will CCC emphasize support for the proposed Child Poverty Act in the New York State Legislature, S2755 and A1160? Raisa, I think you can speak to this one. Yes, thank you. So in my um, comments, I focused on city-level advocacy. Um, but there are definitely uh, state level opportunities, and that's a perfect example. We've been working with state partners in a coalition to draw attention to the need to reduce child poverty across the state um, and have been an early and continued supporter of legislation to establish an advisory group at the state level um, that would be set to reduce child poverty in New York State by 50% over the course of 10 years. Um, so the short answer is yes, we are supportive and very much engaged with those efforts. Thanks, Raisa. Um, if there are any other questions to put in the Q&A, please do. I'm going to actually uh, share a question that we got prior to the webinar today, which was um, asking about how to use data uh, in community districts that include both very rich and very poor, meaning probably households that have very high incomes and very low incomes. Um, please suggest, the, the person asking the question I was saying, please suggest ways for our district and similar ones to understand the data when great disparities are averaged in. And I see Sophia has moved the slide to our database, which is exactly what I was going to suggest too. Um, on our database, we have hundreds of indicators where for specific community districts, including ones where there is um, big differences in incomes, that you can disaggregate outcomes um, if the data are available. And that's really the key. Sometimes the data is not available to look at things more granularly. Wherever we, we can, we do try to disaggregate data. If you filter by community districts, for example, you will be able to find information by other demographic breakdowns. Um, in some of those situations, if you look by, let's call it uh, school districts, there might be other breakdowns like economic need index that you can um, 
be looking at outcomes within specific school districts that really parse out data so that the average is kind of seen in, in multiple categories. Um, so I really encourage everyone uh, to take a look at our online uh, database and specifically the risk ranking also will allow you to look at the indicators um, at the bottom of each page. You can actually click on it to see that specific indicator and see any additional breakdowns. I wonder, um, Sophia, if there's more that we should add to this question in terms of how people might look at different um, disaggregated data within. Oh, I have one more. <laughs> But while, while you're, you're thinking, we do have, for example, a new indicator that we added last year uh, called income diversity. And it's a specific indicator that looks at the 80th percentile of incomes and the 20th percentile of incomes and shows how that's trended over time, which is a really useful indicator for understanding which community districts are those where there's the greatest difference within the community district in terms of income. Sophia at the, earlier in the presentation identified the differences of median incomes for families with children between different community districts, but this indicator, which is called income diversity, looks at within community districts. I'll leave it with that. And if there's more, Sophia, that you want to add. I'll just add that, you know, of course, this is a an ever persistent problem with the aggregate data, right? Because there are, are going to be masking um, the real severity of the issue. And that's why we, we do try and do things like look at median income instead of the average income, um, which can tell us relatively a little bit more information. But I think, Bijan, you gave great points about alternative sources of economic um, um, data. Thanks, Sophia. Any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask is of the, of the policy team, like, um, is there anything uh, else today that you feel like we need to be keeping our finger on the pulse of? We have the pulse survey, which is telling us some of the data, but what are some of the other things on the horizon that you feel we might want to be keeping an eye out for that um, perhaps we can be looking at in, in, in future data? Jen, is your question specifically about um, what you should be looking at in terms of data specifically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, I'll say just generally that there were a number of reports that uh, through city legislation last year, um, there are always certain, you know, reporting uh, bills that come out and, and, and require reporting on certain data elements. And unfortunately, because of COVID, that was one of the, the um, uh, many of those got delayed just for, for understandable reasons, because agencies needed to, to, to spring into action and provide direct services. So that's something that I think we're certainly interested in seeing as some of those reports do begin to, to come back online. Um, those are a good way to get at some of the issues we just spoke to, which is that, you know, there are some disadvantages of some of the regularly provided data and that they only go to a certain granular level. And any Anything that I think the city can do to support, um, you know, more uh, nuanced views of what's happening in communities is really important. So I think that's certainly something that we're, we're looking forward to. That's a great point. And I would add on that in terms of possible data capture on the education side, you know, Sophia mentioned the issue with the state ELA um, tests and that while we have data from, from before the pandemic, during the pandemic participation, those tests really, really plummeted. Um, and for good reason. And so moving forward, it's hard to know exactly how important these tests will be in, in assessing academic measures. Um, but we do know that the DOE is looking into implementing some sort of baseline assessments for this coming school year to try to get a sense of where learning loss was, what areas it was in, the kind of work that needs to be made up. And so looking at what exactly they do and how they do it, and if that could tell us anything about the learning impacts of COVID, which will be something we're looking into. And I'll add lastly, if, um, if we have a, a little bit more time, um, you know, looking and continuing to monitor um, housing instability, particularly number of children and families entering shelter is gonna be important in the short term. There's been um, a lot of, of attention paid to the fact that um, the number of single homeless individuals has risen. Um, and some claims that the proportion of, of families with children in the system have um, decreased. It'll be important to see whether that trend holds. Um, we've been in a bit of a unique um, year, to say the least. And um, 
figuring out what happens in terms of housing instability for children is going to be important, particularly when the eviction moratorium is lifted. Thank you, Raisa and, and policy team for those uh, insights. Um, we're gonna be looking forward to doing all of this together as we come out with more information. Um, what I'll be doing right now is just putting into the chat um, the sign up link for our e-action network. Um, if you sign up for this, if you're not already a part of, you will receive all of the updates that we have both in terms of data resources and uh, policy uh, um, analyses that we put out regularly. I encourage you to sign up. I really appreciate uh, all of my fellow uh, presenters today and co-collaborators on, on the report and uh, on this webinar today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, all the attendees for joining us. If you asked a question in the chat um, and we didn't have time for it within the hour, we will get back to you. So thank you so much for your questions and your attention today. Thank you very much.